Good morning. I'm Christy Nicolo here with our special guest, Larry Stein. Unfortunately, Alan Yasmin can't join us today, um, but I have been uh, drafted and conscripted to, to sit in for Alan, and hopefully we can do him justice. I know many of you look forward to his humor, levity, and of course, uh, his knowledge and expertise when it comes to tax concepts. Larry and I will try to, uh, to, to come up with, with something similar to what Alan does on a normal basis here on this Saturday morning. Uh, and and our, today we have two wonderful topics, at least wonderful to Larry and I, and they are Cuperts, which are Qualified Personal Residence Trusts and S-Corporation Stock Planning. Now, those two topics generally don't have much to do with one another. Uh, a Cupert, a QPRT, is short for a Qualified Personal Residence Trust. And of course, S-Corporation Stock deals with uh, certain types of entities that are taxed as S-Corporations for federal income tax purposes. Uh, but nevertheless, we will we will address these topics uh, and, and kind of break it up into two different sections. Without further ado, I'm gonna jump right in. And of course, I invite Larry to, to jump in at any point whenever we, he has something to say or something to add. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping matters. First, the presentation does not qualify for continuing education, but we feel that you hopefully can enjoy it and, and have a, a good time with us here on this Saturday morning. And then finally, within three to five hours after the webinar, you're going to get an email with the recording and the PowerPoint materials. So please uh, feel free to, to take a look. Any feedback is welcome. We appreciate your attendance and appreciate your, your support in making these Saturday morning webinars as fun as they are for us. And then, of course, it wouldn't be anything. It wouldn't be a normal Saturday morning webinar without our advertisements here. So we have an event that uh, aired yesterday for CPA Academy. Uh, that I did with Carl Mill on charitable giving that you can access, I believe, on demand. And then, of course, coming up, we have uh, another Carl Mill presentation with Alan. So if you if you don't want to be stuck listening to the understudy again, you can get the man himself on Friday, February 23rd uh, with Carl Mill. So please feel free to join us there. And then in June, a long ways out, I know, Alan and I are going to be talking for the American, or the, excuse me, the Association of insolvency and restructuring advisors on representing the challenge debtor, how to uh, conduct tax planning and stress control in what can often be a stress and complicated situation. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna get right into the nuts and bolts here. And as I mentioned, the Cupert is not just a name for a, an old video game from the 1970s and 80s. It's also a very widely used estate planning tool. And that is the, the Qualified Personal Residence Trust. And here's how it works in a nutshell. A person owns a house, they contribute the house to a trust known as a Cupert, a Qualified Personal Residence Trust, and they retain the right to, re to reside in the house rent-free for a term of years. The IRS, based upon the Internal Revenue Code, treats that transfer as a gift of the house, but not of the whole value of the house of only the actuarial value of the end of the remainder term. Here's an example. I have a home, it's worth a million dollars. I wish I did, but say I did for this example. I put it in the house, in, in the Cupert. I retain the right to reside there for 10 years. Based upon my age and IRS actuarial tables, for the sake of this conversation, we'll say that the 10 year term interest has a $400,000 value. Well, then I've been considered to make a $600,000 gift to the trust. And what this can enable me to do is leverage this possessory interest term to cause the value of, that, of the house to pass to my descendants after the 10 year term without incurring any further gift tax or additional tax cost. The other benefit to this Cupert is that I can reside in the house rent free for 10 years. After the 10 year term, I can still reside in the house, but I have to pay rent, fair market value rent. And you may be thinking, well, how is that a good thing? You got to pay rent in a house that you owned. Well, it may not seem that way at first blush, but the rent payments that I make reduce my estate for federal estate tax purposes, which means that I can continue to make, quote unquote, transfers to a trust for my descendants without having them be considered as gifts. And what's more, the trust can be structured as disregarded for federal income tax purposes so that there is no income tax 
on the receipt of that rent by the trust. Okay, so that's a very useful tool that that is involved with using a Cooper. Chris, another. I'm sorry, Larry. Chris, yeah, it's a, a couple of questions that, that that you bring up. It's a great pointers that you're bringing up. And so I have a couple of questions that come up all the time. So if you read the slide at page eight, where it talks about allowing a homeowner to transfer his or her homestead or vacation property. So let's start with that. Yes. In, your, in your experience with the client, since, as you said, at the end of the term, there's a rent back, uh, does the client prefer uh, to take the vacation property or the place they live in all the time, the homestead, what are the what you find the client's preferences are as far as putting one versus the other in the queue per? That's a good question. I would say most of the time, if they have a vacation home, that's a prime candidate. But people will transfer their homestead to a Cupert uh, more than you would think. Uh, and and one of the benefits of the Cupert being disregarded is you still get the principal residence gain exclusion. And what that is for for uh, for us to understand under Internal Revenue Code Section 121, if I live in a house for two of the last five years as my primary residence and I sell the house, I can exclude up to $250,000 of taxable gain on the sale of that house or $500,000 if I'm married. Because the Cupert is considered to be disregarded as to me for federal income tax purposes, the gain exclusion still applies. So using the homestead, Larry, as you mentioned, doesn't lose that gain benefit, the gain exclusion benefit that you would have if you in intended to uh, keep the house uh, in your name. So, so, so let's bring up something that actually happened, a real story, a real situation that actually happened involving a QPERT. And I just would like your thoughts because I know you know this stuff and, and I, I just I really am curious. So let's say we have this huge incline, as you know, here in Florida and elsewhere in real estate values. So let's say the client decides to sell what's inside of that coupon. So let's say it could be the homestead or it could be the one that doesn't qualify for the home sale exclusion. Uh, it could be the vacation property. Let's say the gain is is above any exclusions and above the basis in the in the property. Um, who's paying the tax on that? Because this actually did come up. Who's paying the tax on that? And uh, one of the things that came up was interesting uh, with the lawyer involved. Uh, this lawyer and I were emailing back and forth about it. And one of the things we were talking about was when to, you know, because I'm one of these guys, I like it paid right away. I don't want to wait, even though I might be penalty proof on my estimated tax. I like if it's a big gain and a big tax, I like it to get paid. And so we're seeing, we are, we're seeing gains now well above the exclusion amounts. Yeah. And so because of the real estate values. And so, you know, what's your thought process on, it's a grantor trust. So what's your process on who pays the tax and the cash? Where's the cash coming from to pay the tax? That's a great point. So the tax is paid by the grantor. So in my example, I would pay the tax and I would not be a, a beneficiary of the trust other than the ability to reside there. So, you know, there could be a liquidity issue. Some cuperts can be drafted so that the spouse could be a beneficiary. So you can, you know, quote unquote, backdoor payments out to the spouse to allow the spouse to have funding to pay the tax. But Clients should understand that if you set up a Cupert, you know, you're not really going to be able to access the, the, the proceeds. Uh, the other wrinkle here, too, is that you can't buy the house back from the Cupert. You know, in other words, you can't do a Cupert and then later change your mind. As many grantor, disregarded grantor trusts allow the grantor to swap out assets, allow the grantor to essentially say, I'm going to transfer in cash and take the house back. You can't do that with a Cooper. That's in the regulations, unfortunately. And and what, one other follow-up there, uh, suggestions on trustees? Yeah, so initially, you know, uh, the trustee of the Cooper is, is usually the client. And I, I, you know, feel bad now that I've kind of forgotten a really major point about the Cooper and that if I die during my 10-year payment term, the entire value of the Cooper of the trust is included in my estate for estate tax purposes. So, you know, what that means is that if I don't survive the 10 year term, 
um, I at worst break even, you know, maybe I incurred some transaction costs. Uh, but if I survive the term, the, the Cupert is now out of my estate for federal estate tax purposes. So this underscores the idea that I can be trustee during the payment term and I will not have any uh, estate tax inclusion issues because no matter what, whether it's me as trustee of my Cupert or my good friend Larry as trustee of the Cupert, you know, we're not gonna, I'm not going to avoid the estate tax inclusion should I die during the 10-year term. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Larry, earlier I mentioned this idea of how to calculate the gift, and I threw numbers out of thin air because, you know, candidly, it can get a little complicated. Um, but we, of course, have come up with this Cooper chart that should be part of the handouts, and uh, we'll make sure that you'll get a copy of this with the, the slides that are emailed, which shows how to uh, calculate the amount of the gift and possible estimated uh, financial impact of, of setting up the Cupert. So what we've done with, with this particular chart is have you know, different inputs here that can be adjusted accordingly. And if you click up or down, depending on uh, how the, the assets or how the, uh, the inputs are desired, you'll have different results instantaneously come out. Uh, I don't want to dive into this chart because I can spend the balance of our time here today going through it. But if you have any questions, uh, please let me know, and we'll, we're happy to to go over it with you. And this would be part of our estate view program that's being uh, further developed, as I know many of you have heard Alan discuss in the past. So back to calculating the gift. This is a very simple way to do so, and these numbers are a little bit old because I, you know, this is something we did for a client. I want to say in 2014. In fact, if you look on the bottom right corner, you'll see the date. Uh, the way that it's calculated, so if we have a, a home that's worth $2.14 million, and in my case and many clients' cases, our houses are owned jointly with our spouses. So with spouses, what we typically do is have our homes conveyed out 50% interest to each spouse. And the reason for that is each spouse can set up their own Cooper. And as many of you have heard Alan talk about, there's this concept of valuation discounts. So if I own a 50% interest in a home that's worth $2.14 million, uh, in, in that case, my 50% interest is worth not a half of it, not 1.07 million, but maybe something like 910,000 because of a 15% valuation discount. And the reason being is if I sold my house or my 50% interest to a third party purchaser, and they wanted to cash out, well, they can't just sell a 50% interest on a market. They have to either get the other person to agree, and you know, if it's my spouse, she's not a pushover. So you may have to do some, some talking there. Uh, the other part of it is you would have to file a partition action, and a partition action can be costly and cumbersome. So because of those factors, the 15% discount could cause greater wealth transfer effects. So if I do a 10-year Cupert based upon my 56-year-old age in this example, the amount of the gift under the actuarial tables would be about 64%. So if I transfer my 50% interest worth about 910,000 to the trust, I would be considered to make about a $582,000 taxable gift, right? But if that grows at 7%, at the end of the 10-year term, it is now worth 1.8 million roughly. So what I've done is passed out uh, the difference between the gift of 582 and the, the $1.7 million value. So we're talking about a million and a half of value, you know, multiply that, excuse me, a uh, million point two of value, multiply that by 40%, and we got nearly a half million dollars of tax savings, uh, which is incredible. You know, with just a 10-year term, and you'll see from this chart, if you extend out the term, the gift amount goes down. Now, the, the gift amount goes down because, you know, the more, the longer the term, the more likely that I'm going to die during the term, and therefore, the actuarial tables reflect that my possessory interest is worth more of the, the whole 100% pie. Chris? Yes, Chris. Larry. Okay. 
Let's talk about a practical and a technical pointer. So Carl Mills, who spoke on on the webinar, I believe it was two weeks ago, about mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, yeah. he was talking about something that I have had to deal with in real world practice and you've had to deal with, which is the qualified appraisal rules, right? Yes. So whenever we do a non-cash charitable contribution or we do a gift tax return, a gift, and we're going to have these valuation adjustments going on called quote unquote discounts. Uh, the the quality of the appraiser is going to be critical, right? And the qualified appraisal rules are going to be critical. We saw this in the estate of Michael Jackson case uh, back last year uh, in that very lengthy opinion that came down and they really, they really, the judge really went after the appraiser that was used by the Internal Revenue Service because the person didn't disclose that they had previously done work uh, for the IRS. And so, you know, one of the things I try to get into with the clients, which is difficult, is to explain to them uh, this 170 reg that deals with the qualified appraisals that's discussed in IRS publication 561 and in the 8283 non cash charitable contribution compliance form. Um, and so if you make some comments about vetting appraisers, because we were talking a few moments yes. ago about discounts on it. And, you know, you know, a lot of clients will come in and say, well, who do I hire and how much is this going to cost and how do I go about this process? Yeah, well, we well, got to remember, Larry, what's being contributed to the Cooper in my example here is not the house. It's a 50 percent interest in the house. So it's crucial that the appraisal identify the interest being transferred and that the appraiser does well reason his or her analysis, provides your typical comps that you would see apply, uh, you know, whether it's a, a sales approach, a market approach or a cost or income approach, whatever of the three major real estate valuation approaches he, he or she takes. Also, you want to have analysis of the discount. And with the gift tax return to have adequate disclosure, you have to enclose an appraisal. So the appraisal is going to be reviewed by the IRS. Knock on wood, in all the cupers we've done and gift tax returns we've done, we have not had an appraisal of a cuper, uh, but doesn't mean that that won't happen. And, and and Chris, we want to explain to them the difference in the statute of limitations, the valuation statute, the the adequate disclosure versus the absolutely. ultimate. Right. We wanted them to understand that there's two different statute of limitations going on, and that that valuation statute, we want that thing to close. We want some certainty to close there, and that's why the the quality of the appraiser is ultra critical. I think so. Absolutely. And and the other part here too is that if you, you know, you do a Cooper and you report it on a gift tax return, you know, we've seen it reported where it's just a interest in the house and it's just a dollar amount. I mean, you want to be descriptive. List the house, have the appraisal, risk that it's a 50% tenants in common interest. And then because of the actuarial calculations, you have to, I, I usually put that the determination of the gift is as follows and kind of run out, you know, the actuarial software. We happen to use something known as tiger tables, which is very useful and widely used. Very, very uh, useful. The IRS may use it. And we, we often put that in there. That number, way they cr number, number crunchers. Number crunchers number another cruncher. one. Yep. That, so that way, you know, the IRS knows we didn't just pull these numbers out of thin air. The other thing, the other thing is, like you said, on the adequate disclosure, just in general, because we're in taxis and we're filing gift tax returns, uh, we saw a, a, a private letter ruling chief counsel advice several years ago where the person, the preparer, left off the ID number of the family LLC, the family limited partnership, and they said it wasn't adequate disclosure because they didn't put the ID number, they didn't put the IRS on notice of what was being gifted. Now, I, I, was, I will mention that Cuperts, there was some uh, scare that I had and other colleagues had that Cuperts were going to go by way of the dodo bird and be legislated out of existence if the proposed Build Back Better Act had been passed in September and October of 2021. Fortunately, that, ha that has not passed to eliminate Cuperts, or at least the, the version that was proposed initially, the final version did not contain provisions that would abrogate or eliminate the Cupert. Um, but the final version did contain, I think, increases on funding for 
IRS enforcement and personnel. And I had an estate tax audit last year, Larry, where I spoke with the auditor and he said, yeah, we're hiring 70 new state tax attorneys in Florida alone, right? State and gift tax attorneys. So valuation disputes are generally at the top of the list of what the IRS uh, has issues with on estate and gift tax returns. So Larry's suggestions about getting the appraisal right and following the rules to constitute adequate disclosure are very well taken and well received. And if we have any CPAs or other lawyers on with us, because I take these and they're great. And uh, I have sitting right beneath my feet, I just don't want to topple the books. I have the PPC Thomson Reuters 706-709 desk book. And that desk book has all kinds of pointers and checklists and exactly what the IRS uses. You know, like they use a thing called a state valve for securities valuation, yes, right? And, and they use gift valve for uh, that. And, it, you know, if your accountant's not, doesn't, un, doesn't know what that is and you have our email addresses, I'm more than happy to send you a link back and say, this is what IRS uses. And by the way, this is the practice aid that I was talking about the book. So anyway, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Larry. Well, before we finish out the Cupid module, let me just run through a couple of constraints and, and criteria, some of which we've talked about already. So we know that a Cupid must be a personal residence. Uh, you can't transfer an investment property here to the Cupid. It either can be your principal residence or one other residence. And then, of course, the fractional interest in one of those two, uh, which we have discussed earlier. You can only have two Cupid's at one time. You cannot have more than two Cupid's. Uh, and if you have two, one of them must be either your personal residence or a fractional interest thereof. So in other words, you can't have two vacation home Cupid's. That does not work. And then we talked earlier about how Cupid's work. You know, this is just reiterating the, the retained interest term and then the, the fact that if you die during the retained interest term, the value of the whole house or the value of the whole interest that you put in, I should say, is part of your estate. So during the retained term, you know, you can pay expenses associated with the residence, taxes, repairs, maintenance, things like that. Now, I don't think you can do substantial remodeling and there's a host of complicated rules on how to get funding to a Cooper uh, to, to make big renovations or capital improvements to the house. Generally, those are considered as additional gifts made and the, the value of the gift is determined similarly with regard to actuarial tables and interest rates that are in play at the time. So we went over earlier how to calculate the, the value of the gift and also reporting it on a gift tax return. And we also went over using separate Cuperts for separate spouses and discounting. Uh, these are, again, really important and really helpful wealth transfer tools. So I'm gonna pass now down to uh, the, the fact that if you die during the retained interest term, some of you may be thinking, well, hold on now, you used gift tax exclusion on, the, on the, the outset and you die and the value of what you went in is included in your estate. Do you lose the exemption that you used when you funded the trust? And the answer is no you get a credit on the estate tax return equal to the amount of the exemption that would have been used if, if uh, when the gift was reported. So you don't get the benefit of you know, getting the appreciation out of your estate. What you do is get the, the back to square one break even uh, result here, which is not a bad result. That's you know, heads I win, tails I break even. Most people would take that bet most of the time. Uh, and again, we talked about paying rent after the, the retained interest term is, is expired. Uh, we talked about the grantor trust ability of, of, of the trust. The, tr the client can also retain the ability to remove and replace the trustee if there's a third party as trustee. So if Larry is trustee of my Cupert and I wanted to, to remove him and appoint ABC licensed trust company or Alan Gassman, I can do that and that would not affect the estate or income taxation of the trust. Can I ask you, can I ask you on, we're going to talk in the 30 minute session a little bit about sure. grantor trust, right? So one of the controversies that, that I get into with some of the other practitioners is that there's, uh, there's even an act tech podcast, American college of trust and state council podcast on grantor trust reporting. So there's basically two different approaches. You give the social security number and report on the 1040 that way, or you get a separate ID number 
and you and you report a grant, which is what I like, and you get a separate grant or trust statement attached to a 10, form 1041 fiduciary income tax, which I, that's the way I like it. Thank you, but I've had clients actually say, and law firms, prominent law firms, say, oh, I like the, the social security number approach, and I like the I like the ID number. I just was curious on your thoughts. You know, it's we we can go either way. I like the the easiness of getting an EIN and doing it separate. Um, you know, you can do a social security number and get a W-9 and that sort of thing and, and follow that optional approach. Uh, but most CPAs that I talk to like the separate EIN and statement approach. That's what I like. Yeah. All right. So real quick, just a few slides on the QPERT before we wrap this session up on to uh, move on to S-Corps. What happens if you sell the property? Great question. Well, when you sell it during the term of the retained interest term, it can be used to buy a replacement residence. And whatever part of the proceeds are not used to buy a replacement residence must be converted to a GRAT. A GRAT is an acronym for a grant or retained annuity trust. It is a cousin of the QPER. They work very similarly. So with a GRAT, assets are held in a trust and the person who contributes the assets receives payments back equal to the actuarial value of what goes in. And the, the idea being whatever is in the graph, if it outperforms the interest rate used to determine the actual variable value of what comes out, the delta, the, the increased uh, value would then pass to descendants similar to our, our use of a QPER. So in a, in, as it relates to a QPER, the funds that convert to a GRAT would then need to be calculated at that time and payments would need to be made out to the grantor in order to maintain qualification. And the rules here get a bit cumbersome. I don't think it's you know, worthy of us getting into it in much detail, um, but I can point you towards great resources if you have a question in this area. I know it can be particularly naughty uh, or, you know, sometimes uh, bereft of any particular authority on how to proceed. So it's not something that's as common as you would think. Usually when people sell their homes, they buy replacement homes, but not always, right? So uh, it's worth considering. And then, of course, this is a good asset protection tool because it's held under a trust uh, after the retained interest term expires. In Florida, we don't recognize self-settled spendthrift trusts as an asset protection tool. So during the retained interest term, you may not have that benefit. Um, there is something to consider, you know, if you have a client that might have issues uh, on, on, asset, on the credit protection front, maybe the cupid is not the best thing. I want to mention something that's not in the slides for our our Florida listeners. So, Larry, if you put a homestead property into a QPER, uh, as you know, in Florida, homestead law protects against the disposition of the property on death, meaning that I'm married, I have minor children, I have a spouse. I can't take my property uh, and say, on my death, I'm leaving it to my friend Larry. My wife has vested homestead rights. She can either have a life estate in that property or a 50% tenants in common interest, her choice. That's just the way that the law works in Florida. If, if I transfer this property to a revocable trust and retain the right to reside there or use the property as I see fit, for Florida law purposes, it's as if I own it, meaning that my wife can still make that homestead election. But a couple of years back, there's a statute now in Florida that says, if you transfer it to a, an irrevocable trust, such as a Cupert, and you retain the ability to, to reside there over a term of years, that is not considered to be a device for the homestead law, meaning that my cupid can then say it goes to uh, a third party who's not my spouse or children. Now, of course, if you're dealing with homestead in Florida, any transfer of any interest during a lifetime while you're married has to get the consent of the other spouse. So it's an, an interesting little planning tool for our Florida listeners out there that I was surprised to uncover a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm glad the legislature was thinking about that or else we would have had a potential trap here. And then finally on Cupert's, the last thoughts here, they work well when you have uh, a higher 75-20 rate, which is kind of counterintuitive because now the 75-20 rate issued by the IRS is 2% for March coming up. And that's higher than it was last year. It was like 0.8% at this time last year. So um, you know, if rates are even higher than that, the QPER can work well because the higher the rate, the longer the uh, or the, the more valuable the retained interest term, and the smaller the excess gift at the end. Uh, the other thing to consider 
is that if values are low or expe are expected to increase, a Cooper can be very attractive. Here in Florida, as Larry pointed out, we've been seeing increase in values tremendously over the last year. And who knows if we're in another 2006 or if this is the real deal. Uh, but, you know, they're not making real estate in Florida near the water. Uh, so if you have something like that or client with something like that, Cupid's can be particularly attractive. But but Chris, you know, if we remember the old Walton case with the Walton Gratz, where they have kind of imploded, one of the things that my concern right now is if we're at a pinnacle point on valuation, yep. and we do, we're, we're thinking just like with a Grat, we're thinking about pushing out that appreciation because that's the whole idea, right? Behind the the, the, the cousins, the Cupid and the Grat. Right. So we're trying to push that appreciation out. So now we got high vals so we we had the client has to understand that if we go the other way it could operate the other way on us right, right? in other words we would have had all that transaction cost like with the walton grats and then and now all of a sudden we have all this transaction costs uh and uh, we may burn some exclusion amount right we burn right. some exclusion amount and now we may end up with, we don't get the planning objective, but I think it's important that the audience understands that in light of the high valuations right now. Absolutely, and you know, you talk to some of our clients who are more optimistic than us, or not as cynical as us, I should say, uh, who think that values are gonna continue to increase. But in any event, the QPIRT is here, it seems like it's here to stay, and it's a fantastic tool for the right situation. Any questions on QPIRTs, feel free to email Larry or I, uh, I, I think it's time to, to, I can see Larry getting excited because I know we're on to one of his favorite topics, which is the S corporation. So we'll start with some basics, some tricks, some traps, and Larry's got some great war stories here. And before so, we get can, into- can, can, I, can I interject please, though? The very important. All right. So Steve, Steve Leinberg, Leinberg, and the great lawyers at, at Allen Gassman's firm, including Chris, they write for Lessie. And so many years ago, Leinberg, he, he has these tool and technique books and he says, do a fire drill. So I tell the, the everybody, whoever I talked about S Corp, do a fire drill. If the patriarch, the daddy and the matriarch, the mom were to pass on right now, what would happen? A uh, true story, I got hit by a drunk driver in 2000, lived to tell about it. And so you never know, like, Forrest Gump said, life is like a box of chocolate, so you never know. So if anything were to happen, dad, mom, together, separate, whatever, what would happen to your S-Corp stock? Because as we know, and Chris, he knows this, we all know this, which is, you know, you could only own S-Stock in a trust, irrevocable trust, without a quist election, a qualified subchapter S trust election, or without an ESBIT electing small business trust election, mm -hmm. without these things. And you have to have your lawyer has to pre-mortem draft the documents to facilitate, because you don't want to have to try to go in and do what's called the decanting. You want to try to do this from the get-go right and, and flow chart it out, kind of graph it out. You, an irrevocable trust can only own S stock for a two-year time frame. And a state can own, but it can only do, do be during a, a, a reasonable period of administration, right? Reasonable. And there's a question on the 1041, uh, the fiduciary income tax return, has this estate been open for more than two years? So absent objections or caveats in the probate, et cetera, which can occur. And there's a case, uh, an old case on this called Old Virginia Brick. Uh, that at University of Florida LLM tax law program that I went to and many uh, tax attorneys here in Florida and around the nation went to, they go over this old Virginia brick case. And the, the reality is that we have to answer, is it in a trust, either actual or deemed transfer for more than two years, because we don't want a termination in the S election. And one of the objectives when you talk to S owners is they want to keep that S corp election alive. And so this is really critical to do that little fire drill and that little flow chart that what I call succession planning and figure out where it's going. Right. And I'm sure Chris has seen this. I, I know that, you know, we've seen disasters. I, I actually was talking to a non-certified accountant at a CPA firm and she was telling me that they had no letter of instructions, which is in my mm -hmm. uh, material later, and they had no password list. And the husband died all of a sudden, just one day, had a pulmonary embolism, died. And 
they had no they had to sell the thing for a couple bucks to a customer it was a technology base they couldn't even hack into the computers because nobody mm -hmm. had the passwords to get into this s corp computer software programs that one of the customers was like oh we we need this and the husband was a like a security consultant when he was alive he just died one day he just up he fell into the breakfast nook and was shipped to west boca hospital and was dead by 11 p.m roughly and so you know we hear these stories all the time when you talk to all the practitioners uh, I go all over the country talk to practitioners all the time and we hear these stories nobody has letters of instructions or password lists or they haven't dealt with online digital assets in their estate plans and you want to when you go revisit your estate plans you want to have letters of instruction john scroggin who also writes for lessie he calls it the, the family love letter aba right. has documents if you email me i'll send you some uh, links to where you can find like uh, formats for this kind of thing uh but that's important so thank thank you yeah, Larry, those, those are great points, and, and they apply not only in the context of S corporations, but really any estate plan. Uh, so it, it's it's very well, very great advice. I want to start off on S corps getting into the nuts and bolts by really saying what is an S corp, because I have people call me and say I want to form an S corp. Can you form me an S corp? What is you know they don't really understand what that means and. The way I tell people is there's two different types or two different ways to look at entities. There's state law and there's tax purposes. So under state law, you can have either a regular corporation, which is an inc, or a professional association. Those are corporations. It may be S corporations, they may not be. Then there's the very popular LLC or limited liability company, or less popular, but equally as effective in many cases, limited partnership or LLLP, which stands for Limited Liability Limited Partnership. Say that five times fast and <laughs> see what happens, right? Those entities can be as corporations as well. And we'll get into when that's made in a minute. And then finally, the general partnership or the less effective partnership cousin, uh, the LLP. It's one L short of being effective. The LLP stands for Limited Liability Limited Partnership. Excuse me. And what you need to know is these are the entities that we form with the Florida Secretary of State or with the Delaware Secretary of State to create the entity. None of these actions create an S corporation. An S corporation is created by filing a form with the Internal Revenue Service known as a Form 2553. And all different types of these three entities that I have here on slide 25 are generally eligible to make an S corporation election. Okay. Now, there are requirements to be an S corporation. And just so we can let you know what the alternatives are, the S corporation has its less favorable and more draconian cousin, the C corporation. And the reason why the C corporation is not as favorable is there's a corporate level tax that happens on the outside, right? I had a professor at the University of Miami uh, LLM program who uh, would describe C corporations as the lobster trap. <laughs> Easy to get into, uncomfortable when you're in there, and really difficult to get out of, right? <laughs> C corporations are taxed on receipt of income. What's more is that when they make distributions of assets out, there's a dividend tax. That double level tax can be cumbersome. Almost always avoid a C corporation unless there's a compelling reason to do so, which there are that are beyond the scope of our talk today. And instead, maybe consider an S corporation election. And as I said, you make that by filing the form 2553. And the benefits of an S corporation are that you have income taxed one time. It's received by the S corporation. It flows through to the S corporation owner. Larry and I, we get together, we form an S corporation. We're excited and entrepreneurial in our efforts. We start earning income. 50% of that income goes on Larry's tax return. 50% goes on my tax return. There is no separate income tax with regard to distributions from the S corporation to, uh, to me or Larry, assuming that we have basis in our stock, which we'll get into in a little bit. Those are the corporations. Then we get into what's known as partnerships and disregarded entities. Now these are different from the entities we showed on the earlier slide. These are tax purposes. You could have a partnership, um, an LLC that's taxed as a partnership. Larry and I don't do anything except 
form our LLC. We don't make the S corporation election. We do our business. We start to earn money. If we don't do anything, we will be a partnership for federal income tax purposes. Similar to an S corporation, the income tax comes through. It passes out to both Larry and I regarding our interests and distributions generally aren't subject to income tax. And then finally, there's the proprietorship or disregarded entity, which is a one person owner for tax purposes. I start a business on my own, it's an LLC. I don't do anything. That's gonna be disregarded for income tax purposes. Meaning that whatever's earned under the LLC goes on my 1040. There's no separate income tax return. So hopefully this gives you context as to what we're talking about when we're referring to S corporations. Yeah, uh, Chris, yeah, Chris, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, just, just to interject, something that's going on currently that's really important for the audience to know is the IRS a few years back in 19 put out what's called a practice unit. That's an audit guide for their auditors on mm -hmm. seek a taxation of partners and partnerships. So in the S corp, we got to pay a reasonable payroll versus the distributions. And, you know, in this case law, like Paul, a construction company on that, you know, that in that case, the, the client took about a third out in payroll and about two thirds in distributions and the IRS lost that case. And of course the IRS have been looking at reasonable comp in an S. And we'll talk also about the basis in a few minutes, but on the partnership side, which is really fascinating, Back as we're getting into tax season, the IRS amends their instructions on the partnership return, the Form 1065 and the K-1, and now they have this whole thing about labels don't count, you know? So we're going back to that Hardy case from 2017 where they're getting into, are you a general partner lookalike in an LLC? Are you a limited partner lookalike in an LLC? And should you be exempt from SECA tax under a statute that deals with limited partners that are exempt under what's called code section 1402A13? And the, the, the reality is now you can see that the government is definitely pushing, that they're definitely pushing in at partnerships for sure. When you yes. look at all these practice units, right? And now we just had, we just had the large business international unit just a few days ago announcing that they have a partner basis um, audit initiative on in addition to the S Corp basis stuff wow. that we're going to talk about. Yeah. So so they're really looking, they're really looking at past your entities big time at both S Corps and partnerships. So you want to be in touch with your CPAs and your tax attorneys about what's going on here. But and we'll get into basis in a minute. But uh, uh yeah. I appreciate it. yeah. Great point, Larry. And I want to just clarify a couple of things. So SECA, I think you're referring to self employment tax, correct? Yes, yeah, self employment tax. That's right. That's and right. and that brings up one of the reasons why use an S corporation. Why not be a partnership? Well an S corporation is important because with S corporations you can deduct a little bit more on the expenses perhaps than you would under a partnership. Um, you are required, as Larry said, to pay yourself a salary, and that salary carries out with it uh, employment taxes. And some folks would structure it so that their salary is artificially low and they take distributions out as to the rest of the income. That's the issue Larry's getting at. It's such a big issue that if you make an S corporation election, you would get back, a, you know, a, a, eventually at some point, sometimes your, your beard would be down to here waiting for the IRS to get back to you after filing one of these things. But they eventually will send you something saying, we approve your S corporation election. And by the way, make sure you pay yourself a reasonable salary. There's usually some kind of language on the bottom. Uh, so S corporations are helpful in that regard. As we mentioned, they're flow through entities. There's no double level tax. There's also this new, relatively new thing of the 199A deduction that you would get uh, if, if you have business income, not salary income, but distributions or, or income earned by the entity itself um, that would, would allow you to hopefully qualify for up to a 20% deduction on qualified business income. We could give two hours in that alone. We talk about it later, but that is out there and that's a reason why an S is preferable to a C. Think lobster trap. You know, it's it's most cases, it's not the best way to proceed. A lot of the rules applicable to the lobster trap apply to S corps, but you know, not the double level tax. One such rule is the 351 rule here. So I take assets, I put it into an S corp, Larry does the same. If we have 
at least 80% of the control after the contribution, uh, then we're gonna, those contributions are going to be income tax free. Meaning that if I contribute appreciated assets to the corporation, I'm not going to have an income tax. This is akin to Section 721 of the Internal Revenue Code in the partnership context. Uh, Larry, any words of wisdom here on 351? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep, I got a couple of fast things. One is, let's say I got a brains and money deal. We see a lot of these real estate developer deals. Yep. You'll see them in Southwest sure. Florida, Southeast Florida, Central Florida. So let's say one woman has the real estate. It's substantially appreciated, low basis. And and another another person over here, she is the real estate developer, but she doesn't want to put any skin in the game, no money in the game. She wants to be a service owner. Well, if it's going to be 50-50, that's going to have to be a partnership with a profits interest and in all the new carried interest disclosure rules, right, under 1061 of the Internal Revenue Code that came in under the tax cut law in 17. But if you tried to do that in an S-corp, you would have a gain trigger because you don't meet the 80% control rule in the second bullet on page 28 here. You don't meet that rule. So when I teach uh, partnerships and S-Corps, I try to really emphasize if you have brains and money deal, first of all, you need a really good lawyer to draft that operating agreement on that LLC. And you need to also understand that an S-Corp is not going to work here because of the 351 rule, right? You have to be property transfers at least 80%. So unless you can get that service person to put in enough property to count, you're going to have right. a gain trigger issue for the for the property contributor. And remember, the IRS wants under a reg 1.351-3, they want a reg of statement of details on any corporation, C or S. They want a statement of details on the corporate return, the S corp return, and on the shareholder return under that reg. And so they're going to know what those details are. So I appreciate you bringing this up because I think yeah. it's ultra critical. Yeah, yeah, and, and that, you brought up a couple of really important things about S corps. You know, w one of the big restrictions is that distributions must come out in accordance with ownership. You cannot do these funky special allocations or anything like that that you would see in an LLC tax as a partnership or something. Uh, when the LL when the S corp dissolves, the owners have to receive back distributions pro rata to ownership. You can do voting, not voting. Uh, that is not considered what's known as a second class of stock, and really S corp rules prevent second classes of stock. So uh, that's one constraint you have to operate in with an S corp. You know, in addition to the shareholder issues that Larry talked about earlier. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that with S corps you have a basis in your stock, and that basis uh, there's really two bases if you think about it. There's a stock basis. So for monies that I contribute to the, the S corp or property I contribute, I get a basis in my stock called a stock basis. If I pull out assets and value up to that stock basis, they're tax-free generally, right? Now, if back on the previous slide, we'll show here, distributions of appreciated assets from the corporation to me is going to be taxable as if the corporation sold the assets to me. Completely different from a partnership, right? Partnerships, you generally can distribute appreciated assets the, 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 receive, the recipient of that asset would take the lower basis and would deal with whatever gain or loss would come down the road, depending on how the value of that asset fluctuates. And Chris, in a, Chris, in a real estate deal, it's ultra critical. I can't, I mean, ultra we don't have critical. a lot of time. Ultra critical, because if you distribute appreciated property out of a corporation, you've got a gain trigger. And, right. and whereas you could do a, a drop and swap transaction out of a partnership, and you have a lot more flexibility there. So I appreciate you bringing that up. That's ultra critical. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, when you have loans in a partnership context, Larry and I, he brings the brains and money to the deal. I don't know what I bring. I, I show up and I'm a 50% partner as well in our partnership here. And we borrow money for this development that we're putting together. In a partnership, we get an increase in basis in our partnership interest, which means we can take more money out without recognizing tax. In an S-Corp, you don't get that increase in basis for debt incurred under the partnership. You only get it if you make a loan as a shareholder to the entity. Uh, so here on slide 29, you know, if, if you have a situation where a guarantee by a shareholder of an S-Corp, um, you know, is, is not necessarily going to increase the basis in my stock. So what we typically suggest is 
have the lender loan the money to the shareholder and have the shareholder loan the money to the, the uh, S Corp so that the monies can be then pulled out income tax free. The IRS could try to collapse those into one, uh, one transaction under the fabled and feared step transaction doctrine. I am not aware of, of a situation where they've done that, but these are considerations that have to be accounted for when looking into whether to make that S corporation election. And, and Chris, and there's a new development in this area that uh, I have in my uh, PDF that hopefully we'll get a few minutes to talk about, which is there's a brand new form that everybody needs to be aware of. And, and it's really sending fear into a lot of the preparers' hearts, uh, Form 7203. Uh, this is a new form. In fact, the government put in uh, an emergency memorandum to get this form issued. And this is Form 7203. It's a new S Corporation stock basis and new S Corporation debt basis form. The form is required, and you'll see it in the instructions later. The form is required any time that there are losses or deductions flowing from an S Corp K-1. And they're also required if there's distributions because the IRS has audit initiatives in both of those arenas, in the S distribution arena as well as the S basis arena. And one of the fears, and it's raised by... Uh, Chris here in slide 29 about the uh, you have a get you can't do guaranteed debt into basis and there's also this economic outlay theory which Chris is uh, discussing in the fifth bullet down at page 29 that is an ultra critical thing the leading case in that area is a case called Gilday G I L D A Y and they want you to show in the words of the case they want you to show that the shareholder is poorer in a material sense after the infusion of the dollars in. Even back-to-back -back loans in the fourth bullet have to be done very, very carefully. Uh, there's even a case study in the practitioner's publishing company, Thomson Reuters, uh, de uh, not desk book, but the book on S-Corp planning. There's even a case study on how to do this because a lot of times what the client is doing is coming to us and saying, I need to borrow money to buy equipment. So you have an Article 9 UCC issue in transferring mm -hmm. that in and out and that security package. So you need a really good lawyer and a really good law firm that knows how to do that back-to-back -back loan. And that is a that's critical because you're trying to create basis there because we don't, like, like Chris was saying, we don't get basis in the borrowing at the corporate level. So we want to create that, that basis. So it's ultra critical. And the, the checks for the bank loan have to come from the individual. You have to have the S Corp write a check to the shareholder who then writes a check to the to the bank. And the, to go through those formalities are ultra critical, but this new form 7203, uh, there's a code section out there, 6001, that requires us as taxpayers to prove our items on the tax return. And they, they're very clear in, in this form 7203 instructions about when that form has to be filed. That's a new form for this tax season. And so uh, if you haven't talked to your preparer about your S Corp and about that new form 7203, a lot of banks don't exist anymore. How do I find the canceled checks to prove up my basis? Uh, you know, and, and oh. so anyway, I appreciate the time. Thank you. But that's very important. Yeah, yeah, Larry. And just because we're, we got a huge uh, deck here that we're not going to cover, I'm going to touch on a couple of things. Here's a great little chart showing that the, the benefits and and uh, and detriments of using the various types of uh, of tax classifications. Green means good, orange means uh, a, a little bit better, and yellow means it does kind of a neutral thing. So just look at that. It's it's a really nice uh, chart here. I, I want to talk also about the idea of real estate. Almost never hold real estate as corporations. There's really only one benefit to real estate. In an S Corp, and I'll talk about that in about three seconds. Uh, S Corps, you don't get the benefits of the loan basis, as Larry and I talked about. You don't get the allocation benefits uh, that you would have under a partnership. There's no equivalent to a 754 election that can have great uh, benefits in a partnership. The only thing is, if and when there's a debt that's canceled under the S Corp, the insolvency exclusion for discharge of indebtedness purposes under Section 108 of the Internal Revenue Code is determined at the corporate level and not at the partner's level, meaning that Larry and I buy real estate, as we've talked about. We, we think that we're, we're the, that the trend is, is endless and we're going to make a lot of money off this. Turns out we're back in 2007 again in a few years, and the value is a third of what it was. 
and we have to give the bank back the property and the bank's going to write off the rest of the debt. Well, in, in a partnership, the insolvency exclusion would apply only if Larry and I are insolvent. But in an S Corp, the insolvency exclusion applies at the corporate level, meaning that if our sole asset was this property that's worth a third of what it was when we bought it, and our debt is equal to 80% of what it was when we bought it, which is well more than the value, uh, then we would, the corporation would be insolvent and you would not have income uh, on discharge of indebtedness, which can be a, a whipsaw for a lot of people who aren't aware of this sort of thing. And and I, Larry, Alan and I have given two hours alone, as you know, on this particular yes, code section. So, yes, in fact, in fact, I participated in the slides. You know, I participated in the slides. Uh, to there. If they are really curious, the IRS does have a a real estate foreclosure guide. They really do an audit guide. It's very lengthy but it discusses all these technical issues. What I really want to get into, if we can, is one of the things I always like to talk about here is Quist versus Esben. Yeah, versus yeah. Esben. let's talk about the eligibility of shareholders. So only certain entities can be an S-corporation, right? It's got to be a, a sh an entity where no shareholders or is a non-resident alien, can't have more than 100 shareholders. There's rules, there's attribution rules involved. Um, all of the shareholders have to be eligible shareholders, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. The entity cannot provide for more than a second class of stock, or sorry, more than a single class of stock. So we can't do the special allocations. We can't have class A preferred, class B common. Please let yeah, let's, yeah, let's stop just for a second. So we have a lot of people, and I, I actually can't take credit. Another update speaker, uh, tax update speaker once brought up, all right, so you want to make a charitable contribution of 25% uh, of your S Corp stock to your favorite church. Okay, now let's think through single class of stock rule. When the 75% takes distributions, you're gonna have to give distributions to the church. How do you feel about that? I just raising the question because yeah. this, this is something that people have to kind of think through. Most people don't think about that, right? You can't withhold distributions. That, that constitutes a second class of stock. You can't have been an S corporation in, and revoked such election in the last five years. And that's a, a rabbit hole that we don't need to go down too far, but just know it's there. And then finally, you can't be uh, an insurance company subject to tax under subchapter L or some of these rare you know, situations there in, in the fifth bullet point. Um, as I talked about, you got to make the election. It has to be no more than 75 days following the day on which the election will be effective. Uh, you know, and you have to have entity documents that are in effect as of that day. Here's an example. Larry and I form our S corporation together. The the election to make an S, to, to be an S corporation is not filed until March 1st, which is within the 75 day window. Our operating agreement and our corporate documents have to stay as of January 1. There's no second class of stock. It, none of us can be an eligible shareholder. In other words, my cousin from Italy can't be a shareholder if he's a not a, a resident alien or a U.S. citizen. Uh, on January 1, even though we filed the election on, on March 1st. So very important. Also on the 2553, the form you file, you have to make sure that the shareholder sign consents on the second page. I can't tell you how many times we send the client a letter, sign on the first page, sign on the second page, and we only get back the first page signed. <laughs> I put it, I've been putting it in bold print. If I can make it glow and, and you know blink when we send it, I would do so. Uh, but that's a trap for the unweary. Larry, as we talked about earlier, or you alluded to, there orange you go. Orange highlighters. Orange, orange highlighter. There you go. Well, email, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, our, our work email doesn't do that. We should have some kind of emoji incorporated into it. So it uh, throws confetti over that paragraph or something. Signature tab. Signature right. tab. Go that's for it. it. So that's the old-fashioned way of snail mail. So uh, shareholders who are S-corporation shareholders, U.S. residents or uh, citizens, so green card holders, Non-resident aliens aren't going to work. Disregarded grant or trusts, uh, my revocable trust uh, and irrevocable trust for my spouse and children that uh, I have the power to replace assets for equal, assets of equal value so that that trust is considered owned by me for income tax purposes. That's OK. But Chris, so, as Chris, as you raised in one of the slides and you're 500 yeah. percent correct, got to watch out for common law husband wife because yes. that's that's a partnership according to the IRS. So then you go down to um, 
certain trusts, ESBITs, QUISTs, that like Larry talked about. We'll get into that in a little more detail. And then certain tax exempt organizations, uh, 501c3 organizations here. So we have a chart showing these various types of, of grantor trusts, uh, the QUIST, the ESBIT, the 678 trust or the BDIT is a, another type of grantor trust that's owned by a beneficiary and not necessarily the person who sets it up. So that's a, uh, a trust that's there, that's a potential S owner. You know, then you have a 501c3 organization. So a disregarded LLC. So I own 100% of CJD LLC. It's a disregarded LLC owned 100% by me. It has my stock in the Larry and Chris S Corporation that we've created. That's okay. But if my wife Sophia becomes an owner, even if we own it as tenants by the entireties of CJD LLC, that's probably not safe uh, unless we move to a state like Texas or California that has community property, in which case we could be okay. But I would still get nervous at nighttime <laughs> thinking about that kind of thing. <laughs> All right. So, Larry, you want to just run through some different kind of trusts here? And yeah, how I, just want to do, I just want to do like a high level overview. Okay. Please. So, so when I was younger, a lot of this is before I was a lawyer, this is when I was a practicing CPA in Boca Raton, Florida. A lot of the lawyers would love the Quist, right? This was before the 96 Act that brought us uh, electing small business trusts or ESBITs. So the Quist is when the S Corp makes a cash flow distribution, that's fiduciary accounting income. And then yep. under the single class of stock rules, et cetera, plus the, do the document has to say that you have to further redistribute that to the income beneficiary. So now I just want you to understand the individual owner the deemed owner which is the 1040 person yeah they might be in a low tax bracket that's the advantage of the quist because the individual might be in a low low bracket not the high bracket that we'd have in the compressed brackets of the fiduciary income tax return so you're getting good income tax result there but you have to get the cash flow back and out as it comes from the s corp down to the individual got to get that out and now that person could commingle that money and then you could end up with a divorce. You could have a young daughter or a young son. You end up with a divorce. You could end up with a dissipation of wealth. That's why I said the flow chart. Now, the ESBIT, the Electing Small Business Trust, is spray and sprinkle type of trust. The money comes down and in, but you don't have to further redistribute it. So the advantage is you don't have to t send the money out. You could control the distribution out of the trust. The disadvantage is you're going to pay high tax rates in the 1041 form. In the fiduciary form, you're going to pay large rates. So when I teach this, that's basically the high-level overview so that the client understands and the client also has to understand that the law firm has to pre-mortem draft the plan to give you the flexibility to do what you need to do there on the elections, et cetera. So that's my basically my high level overview on that issue. Yeah, and, and you're right, Larry. I had a, a call with a client the other day and I ran over these choices. And he said, really? Those are my choices? I go, yeah. Or you can just not be an S Corp. That's... <laughs> and, but and they, but yeah, but, and the, but the, I apologize. But the client also has to understand that, okay, so you don't want those choices. If you distribute it out outright, who are you distributing it out out? What's the age? What's the marital status? This is why understanding the family dynamic is so critical in these situations. So yes. So Thank you. Thank you. So just a, a little comment here, a little funny quip. Uh, you know, there was a private letter ruling where you had an LLC that owned S Corp stock. The LLC was disregarded. And it was disregarded because the, the grantor slash decedent created an irrevocable grantor trust that was disregarded until his death. But hold on, he died. And when he died, this LLC became a partnership. So, oh no, you have an ineligible shareholder. And when you, when you have an ineligible shareholder, it blows the S election. As a result, it becomes a C Corp. And now we're in that dreaded lobster trap. However, in this case, the IRS ruled that the death of the decedent was inadvertent. <laughs> so you were able to, um, you know, make it, make it, get rid of the LLC essentially and make an election for the irrevocable trust to be an ESBIT or a QUIST. And, uh, and Chris, Chris, what, what everybody has to understand, which is important here in the federal tax law, is that inadvertent termination relief, according to the legislative history, has to be it has to be liberally granted. And so the problem here is, yeah, you may get the you may get the private letter ruling that you want, but it's going to cost you a ton because letter ruling fees and lawyers to draft letter rulings is not cheap. 
fifteen thousand dollars, I believe, or more, plus the attorney's fees. I mean, it's not easy. Uh, well, Larry, a couple of quick pointers as I know we're, we're running through, running out of time here. I appreciate those of you who are staying late to, to hang with Larry and I on this Saturday uh, afternoon now. Um, you know, we talked earlier about you can't have second classes of stock. Now, one thing that we've done before is have an S corporation um, be owned by an irrevocable complex trust. And that complex trust can be, it has to be an SBIT or a QUIST. In this case, it was an SBIT. And the complex trust allowed the trustee to allocate out distributions to the various beneficiaries, which is perfectly fine. So you can use that wrapper at the top to uh, essentially allocate income from the S-Corp to trust beneficiaries. It's not going to allocate income tax, but it allows the income itself on distribution to be allocated among the, uh, the beneficiaries. And, and Chris, just so they know, if it's a complex trust and they're going to want to make a quist election, they're going to need what's called separate share drafting. That because that's the only way you're going to get that sole income beneficiary as to that separate share. Right. So for that, they don't have to do that. Yeah. Now, in this case, for the client, it was an SBIT, uh, but this is you know a scheme of how we designed the devised it. And for those of you who didn't uh, who don't know, a Q sub is really a fancy way of saying it's a, it was an S corporation that gets transferred to another S corporation and is owned 100%, the bottom S becomes a Q sub. And there's a, a little great uh, reorganization technique I'll get into in just a minute when we, when we get there. Uh, I also wanna mention installment sales. You know, Alan talks about installment sales. They're excellent wealth transfer tools. We use them all the time. You can do that with S corporation stock. You know, we, we have here uh, the, the slides that I think Alan has shown before on spouses funding trusts and selling S corporation stock. You can do it that way. Uh, you can, you know, we've actually done it for a client who had an S Corp here. Our clients, Fred uh, and Wilma Flintstone, who came in, rolled in here one day with on the on the back of their brontosaurus. We did this this uh, S Corporation installment sale transaction where we sold ADC Inc. to uh, to the Bedrock Trust here, and then that gave assets back uh, via promissory note. Perfectly allowable. It's it's a perfectly viable technique, as is. Uh, the graph that we did for Tony the Tiger's brother, Thomas the Tiger, when we, he had an S corporation that was throwing off income, he put the S corporation stock into the GRAT or Grant for Retained Annuity Trust. Payments were coming out on an annual basis uh, to, to, uh, to Thomas, and it worked out just as fine. So these are not necessarily unique to S corporations. I do want to let you know that you can make S corporate, you can use S corporation stock for estate planning techniques that we've been discussing in our regular program and state planning talks. But be weary. As Larry said, make the quist or ESBIT elections for these trusts. We form disregarded grantor trusts to, to do these estate planning transactions all the time. We also, at the same time, file an ESBIT or a quist election. And the rules on the Internal Revenue Code and the regulations say the grantor trust status will trump the ESBIT or quist. But well, one one really criti I apologize. One really critical thing right now is you were talking about build back better is dead at this point. Yep. And so if we go down the road of income tax focus, right? We if we have an intentionally defective grantor trust, we may be wanting to look at selling the non-voting S stock out yes. of the trust, getting it into the uh, what we call reverse revenue ruling 8513 planning. We may want to get that out, what the, out of there, and put cash in the trust and get the stock out, and that way, hopefully, we get a step up if the step up rules uh, right. stay in the code, right? So that's, that's just something we got to think about. Yeah, something we got to think about. Yeah. So just real quick on the income tax side, uh, grant or trust rules trump a quest or an esbit, but I would hate to have the trust not be a grant or trust and blow the S election as a result. So we always throw a safety net. Quister ESBIT election. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is you can't make a protective ESBIT or a protective quist, meaning that you can't say, here's a trust I created, it doesn't own S stock, but I want it to be a quist or an ESBIT in the event that it does. And you just can't do it. So one thing I suggest is if you're ever worried about it ever owning S stock and needing a quist or an ESBIT, create a dummy S corporation, create a, you know, ABC S uh, Inc make an S election, have, it has no assets, transfer it to the trust and then make the election. And, you know, that is uh, one way to proceed. So, Larry, just, we've kind of gone over these slides, 56 and the following slides. I'm gonna just kind of skip over them um, because of, you know, the, the, the time constraints we have here. 
One thing to note is that while an, a resident, a non-resident alien can't be an S Corp shareholder, non-resident aliens can be beneficiaries of ESBITs. So indirectly, they can be, thanks to the 2017 Tax Act, which brought us uh, such crowd favorites as the 199A deduction uh, and the 11 million plus state tax exclusion amount. In that, we also got this little nugget of joy. Uh, so a chart here showing ESBIT election uh, and what the ESBIT actually does. As Larry mentioned, it taxes all S corporation income at the highest bracket, regardless of the level of the income. Now, if it's a disregarded trust that makes an ESBIT, it's the grantor's income tax bracket that's going to uh, qualify. So that is worth, um, worth considering here if you do an ESBIT. The 100 shareholder rule I mentioned earlier, the, as, the attribution rules, here's a little more detail about that. Uh, you know, we have not had many clients that are even near this. It used to be 75 shareholders back when I was in college. Now it's 100 shareholders. Yeah, you can't make the single class of stock rule work practically, right? So that right. that's why we. That's why it's it, once you're beyond a, a few people, it becomes tough tough to stay compliant. By the way, you can do a cat. There are private letter rulings where you could do catch up distributions if you're out of kilter. Hmm. And so if you're out of kilter, there are PLRs. If anybody wants me to go pull my old material, I have material on this. And you yeah, can take a look at the PLRs. You know, the IRS is not draconian when it comes to this compliance. They're, you know, they're very liberal, but boy, the, the, the amount of, of income tax that could be at stake here, if you blow an S election, you become a C corp and any monies that come out could be subject to that dividend tax potentially. It's enough to make me not sleep at nighttime. So we, we try to be as careful as possible. And to that extent, here on page 65, this is language that we put in every S corporation operating agreement that we do. You know, it's a lot of notwithstanding anything to the contrary, a lot of savings clauses. You know, we have an inadvertent termination clause. We have a, a very important rule here at 609, and I'll, I'll just backtrack a few slides. You know, the biggest gray area is second class of stock. And a lot of times this can be implicated on buy sell provisions. You know, one shareholder gets bought out at a different price than another. That can be seen as a second class of stock. Um, you know, if, if the if the share price is at least the book value of the stock or the buy sell price is the book value of the stock as determined pursuant to generally accepted accounting principles, that's kind of a safe harbor. So that prompted us to create this 609 here on page 67, uh, which is a, a very helpful potential safety. Net. Larry, what if you don't make the election on time? If you're a little bit late, do you have relief? Yep, three years and 75 days. Rev Proc 2013, drafted by David Kirk, has flow charts in it. It deals with late S elections, late Quist, late Esbit, etc. And it is it is great, especially those flow charts at the end. And the three years and 75 days. But I want to bring up something that Alan brought up. Sorry about that. I want to bring up something that Alan brought up because Alan's very right uh, in one of the webinars. You know, uh, we can't, you know, we just can't make this up out of whole cloth about the intention. When you read the form 2553 instructions, it says that we've intended, read the second bullet at page 68. We intended to be an S corp from the beginning. We just can't like make that up out, uh, out of whole cloth. But right. it happens all the time. Accountant thinks lawyers filing it. Lawyer thinks accountants. Remember, a lot of lawyers just form entities and just say to the client, oh, you know, nothing ever happens. The client doesn't file it. The accountant doesn't file it. The lawyer doesn't file it. Well, there is relief. Three years and 75 days if you intend it. Absolutely. And things happen. People die. COVID happens. Things like that. Uh, right. And here's the exactly. form 2553 for, for those of us who are interested. It's The instructions are very helpful. The form is pretty self-explanatory. Here's that dreaded second page where you need the signatures of the shareholder consents. So uh, an important consideration as well. All right. So we talked earlier, you must not have previously made an S election and revoke the election in the last five years. Uh, this is to protect, prevent a toggling and a flip flopping on S status. You know, it's the rules here can be really nuanced. So I, I suggest looking into it. And then, of course, the conversion of a C to an S. When I started practicing, Larry, it was a 10 year built in gain period, meaning that C corps that convert to S, if they sell assets in the 10 years after the S conversion, the taxation of those appreciated assets, uh, sale of the appreciated assets is such that as if it was a C corp. Well, that's now been shortened to five years, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Uh, now, there, there are other taxes to consider here. There's a sting tax that if you have passive income exceeding 25% of the corporation's gross receipts, 
you'll get a, a, a tax on that passive income when it becomes an S corporation after the fact. So that's another. But there's good news here, right? Sure. We're, in tax, we're in tax season. We can make a deemed a dividend election under yep. Code 136083, deem the E&P to come out, the earnings and profits from the C-Corp years or from a merger in of a C-Corp. We could deem that to come out, avoid the sting tax and the in that termination rule. We have three consecutive years of the third bullet going on and then we could avoid the whole thing. So if you got a small amount of E&P, it might be a good idea to just go ahead and make that election, pay the tax. Maybe you're in a low dividend bracket. Go ahead and pay the tax because we don't know where the dividend rate's going to go. No, and don't. done. And done. Very good point, Larry. All right. So the built-in gains tax that I talked about, you know, there's more to it than the 15 seconds of uh, attention I gave it. So, uh, you know, one thing to consider is that if we have like a medical practice or something that has a big accounts receivable on their books, pay out a bonus to uh, re reduce the, the value of the appreciation of the appreciated assets so you don't fall victim to this built-in gains tax. Uh, and we have here a letter that we've sent to a, a medical practice client that was looking to make an S election from a C. So here's a, the draft letter. Uh, another neat thing you can do with, with S corporations is something called a new parent F reorganization. And if you look on the left side, the before is the medical practice oh, doing the practice operations, owning the equipment, and the accounts receivable. From an asset protection standpoint, that's not advisable. Because doing so, if there's a malpractice issue, God forbid, the equipment, the AR, and the other valuable assets are now up for grabs. So what we recommend is typically have this new parent F S corporation. Uh, you have the former PA, the former S corporation underneath. This is tax-free, by the way, from income tax standpoint. This entity becomes an LLC that is a Q sub, and then you form new LLCs to hold the equipment, the accounts receivable, or heck, if there's real estate, a, a fourth LLC here. And what you would do is have the assets transferred out on a tax-free basis. It can be a very helpful planning tool uh, because none of this would generate income tax and it's worth considering for medical practice clients. Of course, we have it again here with a little more detail uh, where you have an accounts receivable factoring arrangement, which can be a little bit more uh, cumbersome. Uh, I wanted to mention as well here this, this really neat idea called the S corporation inversion. So I had a client, he had an S corp and he was selling it out to a private equity group. He, he was an S corp on day one. It was an Inc, a state law corporation. What we did in the transaction is we converted the LLC to, uh, I'm sorry, the Inc to an S corp, or sorry, Inc to an LLC. We created a new um, Q sub, or excuse me, we created a new parent that was an LLC contributed the old business down underneath, made a Q-sub election. The next day, we converted the Q-sub, Inc., to an LLC, and by operation of the tax law, that now becomes a disregarded LLC. So my client still has an S-corp up top, disregarded LLC. Well, in this deal, these folks gave my client 75% of the purchase price in cash, right? They paid it to his S-corp. Uh, it was considered as if he sold assets that were owned by this disregarded LLC. So he paid the tax on that 75%. He got rollover equity in the, in the acquirer. And the way that was structured is he took the other 25% of this LLC that was disregarded and acquirer basically just contributed monies into it as a partnership. And he was able to, to have now ownership in this partnership interest. He held the 25% uh, under this partnership. And as a result, he didn't pay any income tax on this 25% until well down the road when he cashed out on his role of equity and made more money than we ever even thought he would, just because of, of how well the company did. Um, this S corporation inversion technique can be very useful, uh, you know, for clients that are selling their assets. And if you have uh, an asset sale uh, to a, to a private equity group or otherwise, you can and rollover equity is involved. The rollover equity can be received by the client on a tax-free basis due to this section 721 of the internal revenue code and this new parent effort reorganization so larry any comments here on this technique no i i like this i like it the only thing is the client comfortable without a plr without a private letter because a lot of times the clients will say what about a plr right a private letter yeah. rule is good. we want a ruling beforehand 
And uh, we'll hear in the next segment uh, when we talk about the uh, 1040 and 1041 uh, techniques, we'll talk about an actual situation that I had. And the question was to whether to get a private letter ruling or not. So that's, well, to, you know. To answer your question, we didn't do a PLR. And the reason why is the IRS has amended their instructions. So the Q sub election is made on the 8869. Right, right. Form. There's a box right. you check if you do this kind of reorganization. Right. And the IRS has approved it. There's, I can't think of the PLR offhand. In fact, it's a revenue ruling. It's not even a PLR where the IRS has come out and said, this type of reorganization works just fine. Right. So, and that, that, that's exactly what we want. We want a PLR. You me, I can send yeah. you a copy of the revenue ruling. Yeah. I have it. Yeah. You know, I can yeah. find it here. Yep. Um, that would be great. And finally, the last slide here. This is the 199A rules. S-Corps are really helpful uh, because you can qualify if you meet the other eligibility requirements. C-Corps don't qualify for this potentially 20% deduction. It's worthwhile to consider it when doing an S-Corp or a, a, a ration versus a, a C-Corp. Partnerships also qualify here. I want to make that note. But there's a, big, there's a big difference here. Okay, yeah. so on the 199A regulations, it's very, very clear that S-Corps can take reasonable W-2 comp, right? And right. Tony Nitty, one of the top thought leaders, he's now with EY, federal taxation, he he brought up in an article early on that the Schedule C owner can't take a W-2, and the IRS is held to that old Rev Rule 69-184, no W-2s to owners and partnership entities. And so there's a huge difference on the W-2 wage limitation if the client is above the, ta the, the income thresholds, right? So the S-Corp shines here. Uh, the yeah. partnership is is a problem just because, Great yeah, point. you could have QBI, you could have UBIA, capital base, unadjusted basis immediately after acquisition of qualified property, but no W-2 in the tank for the owners. So that's the huge difference here. Thank you. Excellent point, Larry. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. This has been great. I've really, really appreciated it. Same uh, here. Thank I'm you. I'm going to parish you out. I, uh, I look forward to hearing your talk on 1041 and 10, I think it's 1040s and 1041 planning. Yeah, we're going to talk about 1041 issues for about 30 minutes and 1040 issues. And the big thing there, uh, if, you, if you're going to tune in with us, is please, please, uh, Alan Gassman wrote this uh, great book on uh, IRA beneficiaries and qualified plan beneficiaries. That's one of those things I see a lot of lawyers and CPAs, they go, You'll hear stories about that. They don't know how to read their documents. They don't read the beneficiary yeah. forms. Of the layperson certainly does. We see not. And that's critical to post-mortem uh, income tax planning. Absolutely. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, Larry, fantastic. Have a great Thank rest you. of the day. Thanks for joining me again. Let's do this again soon. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this uh, Saturday afternoon. We hope that you enjoy the income tax tips and strategies for Form 1041, a decedent heir beneficiary Form 1040. I did tailor this down for a 30-minute discussion. My contact data is there at the bottom, and my LinkedIn is at the very end of the PDF. I hope you're going to enjoy what we're going to talk about here and that it is useful to you. I use my uh, CP continuing professional education course disclaimer in here instead of drafting a custom one. And let's get started with the first topic, a basis. Uh, what I find out there is that many of our clients and taxpayers and lay people find it uh, very difficult to find their records. Uh, they purchased real estate back 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, we had a specific situation involving a client uh, setting up a trust, and one of the questions we got into was uh, what was the basis of the original real estate that went in? Uh, also, we had the qualified appraisal rules in that situation, too. Uh, as I started to look down the appraisal, it did not appear to meet the rules that I uh, read in the regulations. And the qualified appraisal rules, anytime you have a gift tax return or you have a non-cash charitable contribution, uh, IRS talks about this in the non-cash charitable contribution form 8283. They also talk about it uh, in the reg, uh, the 170 reg that deals with that issue. And it's important to, to have proof of your basis. Uh, you're going to sell things over time.
time and having proof of that basis is ultra critical. Yes, IRS has a publication 551 and IRS publication 551 deals with basis. Uh, but the first thing uh, is the, of course, what everybody wants, which is the basis step up, right? Uh, by the way, basis can step down as well under uh, the statute. Uh, Title 26, by the way, is the United States Codes of Laws, if you will want to read them for whatever reason. Cornell University has a online tax law library online for free, Cornell uh, University. There's also a website called Legal, L-E-G-A-L, -E Legal, bit, B-I-T, stream.com, legalbitstream.com, and that also has um, ways to read uh, tax laws if you're interested in reading these sorts of things. Uh, basis step up or down has been preserved under the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act law, and that is important to know. Community property has a very interesting aspect to it. Uh, if you hold assets in community property, uh, both halves of the community property step up or step down at the first death, when the first person dies. Uh, whereas in a common law jurisdiction like Florida, if you have a joint tenancy created after what we call the Gallenstein rule after 1976, you have a bifurcated basis, right? So that's an important distinction. Now, a lot of people say, if I move from Louisiana, I teach still in Louisiana. I used to teach in, in other community jurisdictions. I still teach in the state of Washington, which is a community jurisdiction. Uh, if you move to Florida and you go to see an attorney in Florida and you preserve your community property rights under Florida's adoption of the Uniform Disposition of Community Property Rights at Death Law, can you get the Code Section 1014B6, the both halves, stepping up or stepping down at the death of the first spouse? And the answer is yes. And that's why it's really important if you're moving from a community jurisdiction like a California or Arizona or, or Washington State or Louisiana, which is a unique jurisdiction, it's Napoleonic Civil Code jurisdiction. If you're moving to Florida, it's important to visit with a lawyer in the common law jurisdiction to figure out whether or not you want to avail yourself of community property. And a lot of uh, what I call Ozzie and Harriet marriages, long-term marriages, uh, it's very common uh, that the husband and the wife uh, view that as a marital long-term partnership, and therefore they want to get both halves to step up, and they like the idea of community property, the fact that one half is controllable by each from a state law perspective, and they like that kind of idea, which is, is great if they like that idea. Uh, and uh, we uh, lawyers here in Florida, we know about this and we can help the client uh, get to the goal they want to get to, right? We can help them get to that goal. Now, Alan Gassman did this unbelievable webcast several months ago. And if you email him uh, or any of the great lawyers at Gassman uh, Law, you'll see that the, he did a wonderful um, webcast that dealt with the Florida's recent adoption of a community property trust law here in the great state of Florida. And I would defer to him for sure that he's gonna know much more about that than I do. And I will tell you that I actually viewed it. I viewed the webcast when he discussed it. I remember seeing it because I said, oh, this is new and this is going on right now in Florida. And he'll tell you about what I call the good, the bad and the ugly about that that recent adoption of a Florida community property trust law. So I, I would reach out uh, to him. I really appreciate, by the way, all the work that Kelsey uh, did, uh, Kelsey Compton on, on these webcasts, not only mine here, uh, that Alan invited me, and I do appreciate that Alan invited me. But in addition, I appreciate all the work that they do every week for us, uh, both in the Thursday report, and I read those things, I really do. And so those are useful to me as a Florida lawyer and a Florida CPA. Uh, many clients are more interested these days in income tax planning because when you look on a macro basis at the number of people who will pay a federal estate tax, it's very, very few families that are impacted by a federal estate tax. They're more interested in the income tax planning. And so basis planning, we were just talking in the last segment about what's called reverse 8513, reverse revenue ruling 8513 planning. What's that? You set up an intentionally defective grantor trust many years ago and you got non-voting S stock or family LLC non-voting units in there, or whatever. You might consider 
a sale of those assets out of the trust to the individual so you can get the step up in the basis if you'd like to plan into that. Uh, you might want to do what we call reverse 8513, reverse revenue link, reverse revenue link 8513 planning. Uh, that is something that they bring up at the leading estate conference, which Alan goes to. I've actually said hello to him at the University of Miami Heckerling Institute. Uh, this year, Orlando got canceled. They're going to do virtual again, but uh, we'll eventually be live there in Orlando again. Uh, about 3,500 estate planning professionals attend that every year. And so uh, the bottom line is, a lot of people are interested in the income tax side. Now let's talk about some potential traps and some potential things we have to be aware of. For example, code section 1014E of the Internal Revenue Code, the one year rule. The way that rule works is if I give an asset to somebody and then they give it back to me through their will in a year, there's no step up or step down in terms of that. So we have an example of Obi-Wan. You know, I'm a Star Wars fan. Obi-Wan never told me about this. And of course, the client has to be job at a cut because that's the client that doesn't have any basis records and jewels all over the basis records and there are no records. And the purchase cost was under the Internal Revenue Code Section 1012 in Jabba's land on Federal Highway in Del Boca, Del Boyne, another good old Seinfeld thing, $400,000 cost basis, fair market value is a million six, the stepped up basis would have been under 1014 and a million, a million six. But again, if you have this trap door, you have to be careful of the trap door, right? So we want to be careful about that. Watch out for income in the respect of a deceit in time to tell a famous income in the respect of a deceit in war story. True story. Got a phone call from these very bright lady uh, accountants, CPAs, and they said to me, uh, we've been to your courses and this and that. We got a guy who died last week and we want to know step up in basis. He's got a zero basis and the sale is going to be several million dollars. I said, when did you enter into the purchase and sale agreement? When did your decedent client, and, and when did he enter it? Oh, many, many months ago, he entered into this purchase and sale agreement. And then all of a sudden he got sick, went in the hospital for about a month and then croaked and died. Oh my, I said, did you read the Tax Management Inc. BNA tax portfolio on income in the respect of a decedent? This is called completion of material acts doctrine and they said what i said there's a doctrine out there and some case law uh, that deals with this and it says that if all of the material acts that were preceding they conditioned proceeding to the closing if they had occurred all you really did was put off a mere ministerial closing there is no step up i said i said it's not a private letter ruling we'll get into that in a moment it's not a private letter ruling but you ought to think about this this is something you should think about go think about a private letter ruling i said the good news is a couple of weeks before that ruling comes down they're going to tell you good bad or ugly what's what they're going to rule you could retract the ruling but they'll go audit you they'll know who you are they'll know what you were looking for so it's up to you all what you want to do are you available for the ruling? I said, I happen to be on the road. Back then I traveled quite a bit uh, and I was on the road. I said, I can't. And I told them about the ruling fees and the costs and all this other stuff. But my concern there is that income in the respect of a seat and installment sale contracts, IRAs, this sort of thing, doesn't get a step up or a step down basis. Those are income in the respect of a seat. Those are special items. If you read IRS publication 559, why do you want to know about IRS Publication 559, Deceited Beneficiary 1040 Income Tax Issues, Fiduciary Income Tax Issues? These are very, and that's a very important publication that IRS updates every year, Publication 559. If you forget anything, you can't remember, my email address is here. Email me. I try to send you a link to an article or something that you need to know, whatever, there, okay? So when those two ladies called me, I said, look, I said, you know, I'm not charging you for this. So the, the, the advice is what you paid for it. I said, I said, you know, I would definitely either look at a PLR, look at that tax management Inc. BNA portfolio on the completion of material acts doctrine and income in the respect of it. And I said that that's basically like an installment sale. Now, as I said in the last segment under code section 6001, that's a very important code section. 
because that tax code provision says we have to prove our items on our on our tax returns. And if you were to Google Schedule C sole proprietorship audits, I'll become an audit records two page document that the IRS has about what kinds of records they're going to ask for diaries and log books and calendars and cancel checks and these sorts of things. Very important as we're coming into tax season to know why it's important to cooperate with your tax return preparer and understand the, how to pick and vet a really good tax return preparer, right? And I teach uh, a lot of tax return preparers and I teach a fairly sophisticated advanced type of continuing education to tax professionals, but um, that's how the government, if you read the documentation, that's how the government gets most people is the people don't have the documentation. So they end up in audit saying, okay, just charge me the tax and the penalties and the interest. Now there's a couple of new forms you need to know about. IRS form 7203 that I discussed in the last segment uh, with Chris uh, about S Corp shareholder stock basis and S Corp shareholder debt basis. We're gonna see a copy of that in a moment. That's a brand new form. In fact, the government even asked in an emergency memorandum for permission to go ahead and issue out this form and the form instructions. And this is now out there. This is now out there. And what it wants us to do is calculate the S Corp stock basis and the S Corporation shareholder debt basis. And what it wants us to do is to do that anytime there's losses or deductions on a Schedule K-1 for the S Corp reported out to the shareholder, anytime there's a non-dividend, in other words, an ordinary distribution out of stock basis, they want to see the actual schedule. So now they're actually asking us on an actual form to produce that. That's brand new this year, brand spanking new. So if your preparer comes to you and says something about that, I just wanted you to be aware of it, right? The other form that's brand new is IRS form 15254, revocation of a 754 election. So one of those things when we do family LLC work and family limited partnership is we're figuring, okay, we got a commercial office building inside of this family LLC or inside this family limited partnership. If any one of the owners who are senior owners pass on to the great education course webinar in the sky that we're hoping that we can get an optional basis step up in the building and the building is depreciable in nature and so we're hoping that one of the relatives who's going to inherit that unit in that family llc we're hoping they're going to get some additional depreciation off that item that 754 election item and so what happens sometimes is they come to us, the family, years later, and they go, you know, there's a lot of costs with this thing. You got to have the lawyer involved, the CPA involved. You need a, a real estate appraiser, an entity interest person. Maybe we should get out all this cost. Maybe we should undo the 754 election. Now, 754 elections aren't made like the first year of the partnership LLC. They're made on the, either the first death or the first sale. They don't have to be made. It's an optional basis, an elective optional basis adjustment. So, so the question is whether to make it or not. That's in consultation with the CPA's attorneys, the client. But then if you want to get out of it, in the old days, you had to ask for a private letter ruling. You still can ask for a private letter ruling, but that costs a lot of money. So the government came up with a streamlined way a couple of years ago. They came up with this new form and they say, you know, great, you know, uh, this can be made on 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 a, uh, a form. And if you read the form, we're going to see the form in a moment. Uh, the form is great because the form has all the typical reasons you would go out of this thing. Why? the change in the nature of the partnership, uh, the number of sales that are going on. There are a number of things in the private letter rulings that have been called there by the IRS and put in the instructions to the form. So let's take a look at the forms just for a moment, and then we'll move on down the yellow brick road. This is form 7203, the S Corp shareholder stock and debt basis limitation. This is the draft as of October. I do apologize to the audience. They did do an update to this. They actually put out December instructions and now we're gonna have final obviously. And this is the, uh, the form itself. On part one, you calculate the stock basis of the shareholder of the S. 
And in part two, they do the S corporation debt basis and the shareholders debt basis, right? And as Chris and I were talking about in the last segment, we were talking that you don't, it's not like a partnership where you get partner share of partnership liabilities here. We're talking about direct economic outlay into the S corp, whether it be a, a proper back to back loan that like we were talking about, or just we made a share of the loan payable with a promissory note. It could be open account debt. Uh, and uh, this is a very important form. It's a new form. And when do you do the form? That's, of course, what everybody always asks. When do you do the form? Bottom left-hand corner. You're claiming a deduction for your share of aggregate losses or aggregate deductions off the K-1, including uh, a carryover from the previous year. You received a non-dividend, not at an ENP, a regular stock basis distribution and they want you to prove that it's coming out of the stock basis tax-free. They want to know if you received a loan repayment because loan repayments, if the face amount of the open account item or the note is at full amount, never used basis in the past out of the note to write losses off, you can get a tax-free repayment out of the loan basis. But if you previously reduced the loan basis and now you repay it in whole or in part, there's an income recognition transaction. And so they want to know that. And then the government is getting real interesting. They go, it might be beneficial in the tip box to complete this thing every year to keep track of your basis in your stock and your basis in your loans, uh, even though it's only required in the events above. So uh, we know that this is a problem area. The American Institute of Certified Public Accounts, of which I am a member of them, uh, the, their organization several years ago, asked the government to consider a proposal that the government, the IRS, said no to so far. They said, why don't we have the QuickBooks preparer for the S Corporation? Why don't we have them just every year update these schedules? And why don't we attach them to the K-1? And why don't you consider that our beginning point here on the proof issue? That would have been great because the QuickBooks preparer, whether it's cloud-based bookkeeping or not, they usually will do that as part of their uh, practice of writing up the books of the business and the S Corp. And that would have been great if the uh, IRS had embraced that. So if you want to write your congresswoman or congressman about that, I'd appreciate that because I'm one of these guys who's very practical about the U.S. tax law because I've been teaching it so many years since the 80s. And the bottom line is that I really want to see some more pragmatism out there. And so this is going to be an interesting requirement under Code Section 6001 uh, to prove up basis and file this form. How do you do that if your banks are merged out of existence or you can't find the canceled checks? What do you do, right? What do you do? So this is the other new form that I mentioned, uh, 15254, request to revoke a Section 7. 54 election, and they want to know if you've ever previously done a revocation before, or asked for one. Is there a substantial administrative burden on doing the 754 election appraisers and time with the lawyers and the CPAs, etc.? So they're giving you basically a roadmap to the reasons that they will allow you to get out of this, and then they're very open in the instructions and telling you that. If you can't get it this way and you want to go do the old style private letter ruling approach, even though it's uh, much more costly, uh, you could do that. So this is an important form to study uh, if you find yourself in that set of circumstances. Let me make a couple of comments about distribution planning. We're here is still in the 65 day rule. Uh, I don't know if you watched Alan's webcast last Saturday, but it was extremely, uh, extremely informative. Uh, I, I tuned into part of it. I, I had some obligations, but I did tune into part of it. And um, the reality is he brought, I heard him, I heard him bring up the 65 day rule. That rule says that any distributions in the first 65 days, if we have a calendar year, trusts, trusts have to be on a calendar year. Estates can pick a fiscal year, but trusts have to be on a calendar year. And so if we have a calendar year, the first 65 days, here, we might be making a distribution and we might want to make a distribution because we might want to get the income tax out to the individual beneficiaries and not inside of the fiduciary income tax return. The Form 1041 fiduciary income tax return has compressed income tax brackets. 
you're going to pay a lot of tax inside that 1041. Now, obviously, you have to understand the instrument because the instrument controls everything, right? Whether it's a will for an estate or whether it's a trust instrument for a trust. And distributable net income is your governor. That's a tax code concept that is your governor of what can be distributed both as to ordinary income, tax exempt income, and if the instrument and state law cooperates, capital gain as well, right? So there's two concepts here. There's distributable net income, which is a tax concept that has a taxable component to it and a tax exempt component to it. And then we have to look at the instrument and the drafting's critical because the drafting controls the DNI taxation and the flow out, right? between the fiduciary and the individuals. Remember the basic concept of fiduciary income tax is to the extent you retain fiduciary accounting income, that's state law accounting income, we'll get into that in a moment, and distributable net income inside the 1041 fiduciary return, you pay the tax inside of there. To the extent you distribute it, the general rule is the individual beneficiaries pay at their rate. So this is something that you and your accountant and you and your tax attorney and a trust and estate attorney can discuss, right? Uh, and this is important. Now, what is fiduciary accounting income? That implicates upon a lot of things. Uh, there's, a, there's actually a statute in the Internal Revenue Code 643B at state law income. So if the instrument tells you how to allocate things between income and corpus principle, then you follow that. Otherwise, the state law that controls that particular entity whether it be in a state or a trust the particular state law involved that's what tells us what goes into that particular uh solution so we have two things we're tracking we have fiduciary accounting income state law income what does the instrument say and also distributable net income and distribution planning is a critical thing between looking at the fiduciary the 1041 and looking at the decedent heir beneficiary 1041, I'm sorry, 1040, I apologize. Residuary bequests in a will or a trust, they always carry out distributable net income. That's because under the statutes and the regulations they're under, they're not ascertainable with reference to the instrument at the time of death, because you might be allocating certain expenses against it, and this sort of thing, right? So that's why, and we already talked about this, the 65 day rule. One more rule I wanna talk about. Specific bequest of property or money. If you're drafting a document with your lawyer and your CPA, if you want to do a pre-residue bequest of a specific property or a specific dollar amount, money, that disengages the normal DNI distribution rules and therefore they don't carry out DNI, which means that the the money or the property goes out but the person who's getting it doesn't have an incident of taxation on a scheduled k1 for that item so that's very important drafting when you're sitting down with your lawyer and your cpa and looking at that that is a very very important thing to think about a few more comments i know that i'm limited to 30 minutes and i don't want to hold you any longer than you have to one of the things we look at is if we have a living trust at the time of drafting, which is very common here in Florida, and a pour over will that pours assets from the probate that haven't been pre-funded into the living trust, if it pours it into the living trust where the dispositive guts of the document are, right? We usually do what's called a qualified revocable trust QRT election. And the reason is trusts are forced to have a 1231 year, but an estate can have a fiscal year. And if you're not a taxable estate, you don't have a, to file an estate tax return of Form 706, you could do this for a two year time frame. And there are certain advantages and disadvantages of doing this, but this is something you want to look at and just something you want to consider. And I put a copy of the form in because even in the form instructions, they talk about or why it might be good to file this and why it might not be good to file this. S-Corp continuation might be a reason because an estate can own S-Stock, period, end of story. A trust, it depends on whether the trust qualifies or not, as Chris and I were talking about in the last segment. So that's one of the reasons. There are other reasons, but uh, there are reasons pro and con. Now I want to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. 
I talk to a lot of CPAs and a lot of lawyers, right? Because I'm a lawyer and a CPA. I teach continuing education. I also practice. And so I talk to a lot of people. And I'm just going to tell a couple of war stories quickly that illustrate how important it is to read your retirement plan documents, to read your IRAs. Please, there's two things you could do for me uh, after this webinar that I would really, really appreciate. And if you send me an email that says you did this, you don't know how happy I will be. One thing you could do for me, I discussed in the last segment, please have a letter of instructions. That's not a will. That's an informative document that tells me what your email passwords are, what your online passwords. How do I get into your TD Ameritrade account or whatever it is, Schwab account, Fidelity account? How do I get into your IRAs? How do I get into all these things? What do you want? Do you want your granddaughter or niece and nephew to grow up to be an artist or whatever it is, right? These are, these are what we call precatory but they're informative, especially the email thing. That story is a true story from the last segment. The woman is sitting there over a Panera bread, chopped chicken Caesar salad, telling me about the death of her first husband. I don't think she got remarried, but first husband, and about how there were no passwords to get into his S-Corp accounts, and his S-Corp had to be sold for $10 because they couldn't hack into his online accounts for the technology for his S-Corp. And we sold for ten dollars. How many of you have a roadmap? You don't understand. Yes, Gmail has a privacy manager where you can go in there and say, "Okay, I give the permission of the following person to get in there." Digital assets estate planning is what they call this, by the way. Digital, you could Google digital assets estate planning, and. Yes, Florida, we have digital asset laws and you could put in your documents. OK, I want this to go on, that to go on. But you want to have an information letter. If you can't find a format, you email me at taxman532 at Hotmail, taxman532 at Hotmail, just like the Beatles song, taxman. And you email me and I'll try to find you a format out there and send you a link and say, please do this. Please read your IRA documents. Please read your beneficiary forms. Please read your, and now we're going to tell a couple of war stories, tax deferred annuity. So I was friendly with this woman who was the mother of one of my friends at the time. He was a professional person. Uh, we knew she had, she had lung cancer. So we knew she was in the hospice at home. So we knew that she had limited time. I was actually teaching in Detroit and he called me up and he said, mom passed on. I just had had lunch. My mother, may she rest in peace and me and their family, we had lunch together. It was Memorial weekend and um, she passed on. And so I said to him, you know, I'll go ahead. And I know her. I'll go ahead and take care of the probate. And if you need any support, let me know. And he did call me and he says, the broker told me the following about this tax deferred annuity account. He told me I have to take the money now or <coughs> I'm stuck with the five-year rule. The five-year rule is a default rule that if you don't name what's called a designated beneficiary at all, that's the default rule. Pay it out by 1231 of the calendar year that contains the fifth anniversary of the date of death. That's a very short payout period. So I said to him, do you know how to read these documents? He says, no. He says, do you? I says, yes. And he says, I'll, he says, I'll get you copies of everything. Okay, fine. So I took my mother out to San Francisco for a little break. And I was sitting, we got delayed by a hurricane. So I'm sitting there with my typical orange and pink highlighters. And, and I, I said, the broker, stockbroker, didn't tell you about a rule that's in here. You see the document controls, the document controls, the document controls, right? So I said there's three rules in the document. You could take the money in the year after death. That ruins all the deferral. You could use the default five-year rule, or you could take a life expectancy path. It's like an inherited IRA. It's like you're a surviving wife. You could leave it in the name of the deceased husband, and you could take as a beneficiary, and you could take over a life expectancy path. That's a long deferral. You could take more than the minimum distribution, but you got to take just the minimum, and that's a stretch. That creates a stretch. And we'll get into the whole issue of the new law, the Secure Act law that just came out a couple of years ago. 
bottom line, bottom line was the broker sat there with us at the side table when I came back and he calls up the company that sponsored the document and they said, that's a sharp lawyer. He knew what he was talking. I said, all I did was read the document. And I said, you know, it's important to understand what your options are in a postmortem fashion after the death of the owner of the account. So what really makes this interesting is that we now have a new law that came out a couple of years ago called the Secure Act that forces a new 10 year rule at us in certain circumstances. So what I did to try to keep it plain English for you at page 26 is I sent you in the PDF, the inherited or stretch rules under the SECURE Act, what they call the eligible designated beneficiary rules. We are, we are waiting for regulations. The regulations still have not come out of the treasury on the law, but we do have the, the, the guts of the law. And if you go to the American College of Trust and Estate Council website, they have a couple of short podcasts. One is by the leading expert in the country, in most people's opinion, uh, Natalie Choate out of Bingham. Uh, well, she used to be off council to Bingham in Boston. Uh, she's probably the leading expert, Natalie Choate, C-H-O-A-T-E. And she has a nice PDF up there that you could read. It's about 80 something pages long that updates you on the SECURE Act rules in plain English. And she does a great job on these. And you should really read uh, this eligible designated beneficiary that's available for what they call a modified stretch, a modified deferral would be surviving spouse, which is the most common naming on a beneficiary form. Uh, that includes a trust format for the benefit of surviving spouse uh, drafted properly. And then we have minor child, minor child of the participant or trust format that qualifies thereof. Then we have chron chronically ill beneficiary. And then we have disabled beneficiary. And the what reason, one of the reasons we're waiting for regulations is we want to know how to draft those trusts clean, right? And they also have a multiple party, chronically ill, disabled. And so we want to see how they want us to draft that. And then somebody who's named as beneficiary who was within 10 years of your age, within 10 years of your age, or the owner of the account. So that could be, for example, a, a sister or a brother, right? That would be very, very common to see. And so here in Florida, we see this all the time out there. So the stretch IRA, people say it's dead. There's a modified stretch under the eligible designated beneficiary rule. And if you're really interested in reading about this, you could look at IRS publication. There is an IRS publication. The IRS publication is 590 capital B. There's two 590s. There's a 590A that's putting the money in the IRA. And then there's the 590 cap B taking the money out of the IRA. And if you're interested in retirement plan distributions, there's an IRS publication 575. There's a 575. There's also ones on 403B, et cetera. Again, if you get caught in this and you want me to send you a link or something, you know, uh, again, email me and I'll try to be cooperative and helpful. It is busy season, but I'll try to do what I can do for you out there. Uh, by the way, inherited spousal, big issue, right? We had a woman in Alaska, very bright CPA. She had a client. He was up in his 70s. Wife was in her 50s. He died in his 70s. So the question was, roll it over to her account, roll it over from his 401k to her IRA, or do an inherited, et cetera. And so we did figure out a way to do what's called an inherited uh, an inherited 401k, which you could do that too. You could also do inherited, what's called inherited IRA. And that means you could take money out of the account, pay income tax on it, but no pre-59 pre, no pre and a half, 10% penalty tax, right? So remember, she's under 59 and a half, he's way over, he's in his 70s, right? So that happens, we see that all the time, right? So publication 590 cap B is mentioned on the bottom right-hand corner at page 27. You might find that useful. I mean, I could tell more war stories. I'll tell you one last war story. I was teaching in Kenner, Louisiana. That's a suburb of New Orleans. And there's a woman in the audience and she says, you better read your documents and your beneficiary forms. The following was in a beneficiary form and an IRA document. It said that, Let's say we got Ozzy and Harriet died 
five, six, seven years ago. We got Ozzy, that's the husband, that's the father. And we got two children, Ricky and David, if you remember the old show. Ricky and David, Ricky and David. And let's say Ricky has two children and David has two children. So the question is, if Ozzy dies now, but Ozzy dies after Ricky, Ricky died in an airplane crash after he's freebasing cocaine. You remember that. So that you'll remember the old story. So, so the question becomes, when I do this case study, when I teach, who inherits the account? Is it inherited by David? Or is it inherited half by David and half by Ricky's children? Is it a perceptual distribution? Follow the lines of, of lineage where Ricky's children would step into Ricky's shoes as to Ricky's share? Or is it David? And she read a document that said everything to David unless you indicate otherwise. So that's why you have to read these things and understand them and talk to your attorney locally there and talk to your local CPA and your attorney about these kinds of things, right? Because that's going to be a very interesting issue if you don't read these documents. All right, a couple more comments and then we'll finish up. Charitable contribution substantiation. Uh, I purposely made the PDF shorter. Uh, I could have stuck a whole bunch of things in here on charitable. And Alan has just done some unbelievable webinars on charitable that are on his YouTube channel. And if you could get a chance to see some of these things, they're really, really, really good. I've attended uh, some of the charitable stuff and I have a passion in that area. So it's interesting. This is IRS publication 1771. This is what they give the temples and the churches and the mosques and the 501c3 tax exempt organizations. Here's what you have to give your patron as substantiation. So we saw a case back, what was it, 12 Durden, where this nice tithing, church-going tithing couple was giving money, but they didn't have the no quid pro quo language on the substantiation. It has to say on the, on the substantiation, it has to say, no valuable goods or services were received in exchange for this charitable contribution. It has to say that. That's required lingo. And it didn't say that. So they got this IRS audit notice. They contacted the charity. They said it doesn't say that. So then they got a new set of substantiation from the charity. And the government said, ah, it's not timely. It has to be contemporaneous at the time. Like right now, this time of year, in January, you'll get from the 501c3 tax exempt org, you'll get the substantiation, right? And so they're saying it wasn't like that. It was done because they knew they were getting an IRS audit examined. So this is a very short nine page pub, but it's well worth reading as we come into tax season about do you have the right written communications acknowledgement of any single contribution, $250 or more? Did you have anything that said you got any goods or services for a single payment in excess of $75? Like I had a lady friend, she did a, a benefit concert for uh, the Parkland, we're right near her Parkland right here, and she did a benefit concert, and they were getting stuff in exchange for it, so it had to be disclosed on the statement. So her CPA was doing the statements for her, and that CPA was doing that, was putting that information on there. So that's very important, these record-keeping rules and the written acknowledgement and the contemporaneous requirement that we saw in the Durden case, very very important thing. The other big thing is non-cash charitable contributions, right? The fact that you have to have qualified appraisals. We saw on the webinar a couple of weeks ago with Alan Gaspin, a brilliant lawyer, uh, Carl Mills, and he was talking about cryptocurrency. And he was talking, because I watched it, he was talking about cryptocurrency, and he was talking about charitable contributions of the crypto, and about the qualified appraisal rules. And those are very nitty gritty specific rules. And the instructions here to the Form 8283 actually get into those rules. And there are, and I, there is an IRS publication, just if you want to make a note of it, there's an IRS publication 561. And the IRS publication 561 actually discusses those qualified appraisal rules. Now, remember, the qualified appraisal rules come up in two contexts. They come up in gift tax returns. They come up there. 
and they also come up with non-cash charitable contribution form 8283. And the reason I'm bringing it up is I teach tax updates. And when you look over the years, right, of the of you see patterns, right? So you know that the IRS does correspondence audits out of Ogden, Utah on charitable, right? You see this all the time, right? Uh, really important. Now, by the way, the two pubs that are critical at page 42 on the right-hand side is pub 526. That's the general IRS publication on charitable contribution. And then publication 561, right? Uh, and they're bringing up the 170 cap A rules, the regs there. That's the qualified appraisal rules they are also discussed in this particular form instructions and they're discussed as well in the the 170a reg and they're discussed here in these instructions by the way um i don't know where you're coming viewing us from but qualified conservation easement uh deductions charitable deductions they're auditing that they even have an irs audit technique guide on the issue and they are really looking at that uh, big time. That's a big time thing. So I would encourage you to understand that. I did say I would stay roughly to the 30 minute time frame. This is my LinkedIn account. It's Lawrence J. Stein, CPA, JD, LLM, CFP. Uh, that, will get, that, that and $3 will get you a cup of coffee at your local uh, coffee shop. Uh, but uh, if I can be helpful to you or your family, uh, you have my email on the front end of the, and you have my address in Boca there, Boca Tone, Florida. This is my LinkedIn at the tail end that I stuck in at the tail end, just in case you want to link with me, or and that's a good way to chat with me sometimes. Uh, I do appreciate all of Kelsey's work, all of Alan Gassman's work, and Christopher Di Nicola, and I really appreciate you having me on today and listening to me. Thank you for having me, and have a great day.